Tonight, I wanted to start out with some things about marriage from the National Marriage Week USA.org website. That's where I got this idea to do this, and we'll be doing this each year before Valentine's Day. For my own Valentine's Day, I had the opportunity to get a dozen roses today. It was fun. I can't say I do that every year. Actually, this is probably the second time I bought so many flowers for Valentine's. So my wife was pleased. And in the past, we just settled for the ones I could pick. But this time of year, can't pick too many uh, roses right now. So usually we wait till they start blooming and then bring flowers in from outside. So it was a nice treat to have those. So National Marriage Week, why does marriage matter. There's a lot of things about marriage and marriage matters in different ways. And some of the problems to our nation is without marriage is it causes lots of problems. There's a few interesting things about marriage. Children need both parents. Teen birth rate for girls when their father leaves before they are six years old is 35%, seven times the rate from when fathers stay married. Boys without fathers at home are twice as likely to end up in prison. And those are statistics for the National Marriage Week USA. Marriage reduces poverty. We would have 25% less poverty today if we had the marriage rates we had in 1970. Only 2% of poverty if you finish high school, work full-time and postpone marriage, childbearing until age 21, 77% chance of poverty if you don't do these three things. So that's a 77% chance of poverty. So let me go through those three things again. Finish high school, work full-time and postpone marriage until age 21. So those three things, that's really significant. So in the U.S., marriage drops probability of child poverty by 82%. 82%, that's a lot. Okay, so the benefits of marriage, married adults live longer. They have better health and greater personal happiness reported. Children raised by both parents at home perform better in school, have less addiction, less teen pregnancy, and less trouble with the law. Marriage is the unsung anti-poverty program. So if you're against poverty and you want to help alleviate poverty, then help everyone be married and committed to that. So that's part of the reason I think that I like to say that I do marriage counseling is to help avoid poverty. Single motherhood is the greatest cause for poverty among women and children. Married adults have more wealth and financial stability. Healthy marriage saves U.S. taxpayers, costs $112 billion per year for divorce and unwed childbearing. $112 billion per year for divorce and unwed childbearing. So... Marriage does save a lot of money for the nation and it helps you be more wealthy. So those are a few quick tidbits. Uh, those are big. I remember growing up at church, there was a story told about understanding the value of things. The story is told about a man walking down the sidewalk past some workers. And as he was standing there watching, he went over and asked some of the workers, he says, what are you doing? The first man, he said, well, I'm laying brick. And so, yeah, he could see that. He was taking the bricks and laying them there, stacking them up. Another worker came by. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a building. And that was fine. A little while later, another worker came along. and said, what are you doing? I'm, I think we're building a cathedral. And that was a different answer from each of them. So the kids... He caught another worker going by and he asked, what are you doing? And the man turned and looked at him and said, we are building a temple, a house of God. And 
So what are you building when you are building your marriage? You're building a stronger nation. You're building greater wealth, health, and happiness. So that's an important part of marriage and the value of that. So I haven't heard it recently, but about 10 years ago, I remember hearing about a thing called a starter marriage where the attitude had changed, where I'll just get married and that'll be my starter marriage. That'll last five to 10 years and then we'll divorce and then I'll find my lifelong partner. And so what I find uh, at least half the couples that come in for marriage counseling, many of them lived together five to 15 years before they got married. I always ask, how long have you been married and how long have you been together? <clears throat> and probably most often than not, the couples I get in my office, there's two different answers to that. So the marriage, we can help promote that. So it, when we're with someone, it makes a difference on our level of commitment. Whether we're living together or we're committed or we're building and shaping a family, are we raising children? And another perspective is we are teaching the future generation of the nation, the leaders of the nation. So when we look at our children and our grandchildren, are we just raising children or the new nation? Okay, a couple quotes I like. I'm gonna share a couple quotes, one by Fawn Weaver, a definition of marriage. Love is the reason, lifelong friendship is the gift, kindness is the cause, till death do us part is the length. So that's uh, one definition of marriage. Here's, a, here's one of Mignon McLaughlin. A successful marriage requires falling in love many times, always with the same person. That's one of my favorites. And that's so true. We need to fall in love over and over and over again. And I had that experience today. I, I mentioned I got some roses and I brought those home today. And my wife had put together a little sack with a nice love card in there. And she, she put it on the headboard two weeks ago and said, hey, you can't open that until Valentine's. But when I brought the roses home, she says, okay, you can go get that now. So I felt like I fell in love all over again today. So that was a fun time. So I think this is one, this next quote by Robert Quillen is one of the reasons that my marriage has gotten better and better. And I'm so grateful for my wife and her ability to do this for me. And, and, and so this is the quote, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. So certainly there, we need to do a lot of forgiving. And yesterday we talked about expectations, being more realistic with our expectations. And as we learn what those really are, those realistic expectations, the best skill to have is to learn to forgive over and over and over again, and then fall in love over and over and again. So that's uh, a few quotes there for fun. All right, so now what I'm going to share is about self-esteem. That's kind of the main theme that I'm going to do in this next segment is to talk about and explain what self-esteem is and how we can remember to communicate more gently with our spouse and with our children. It's really important. It's a lot easier when we really understand what we're working with. So the first night we met, we talked about the bad wolf. And that's a good name in that poem. But really, I like to say this is our survival self. And we could also call this our thriving self. So the good wolf, bad wolf, survival self, thriving self. So think about when you had a brand new baby or when you were brand new and when you were just born, we look at these brand new little babies and we look at them so how precious they are and we look at them and yet they are so helpless. They cannot do anything except one thing. They can cry. And so 
we look at the little baby with love and we love them no matter what they can do, but they learn to cry, which is good because that helps them survive. And as they cry, if think about what happens if we don't feed them or check on them to make sure they're comfortable is they start crying. And if that's not enough, they cry louder and then they cry louder. And if they still get ignored, they'll go into a, just a really big, like a rage, a scream. And so even though they come with love, the first thing that they learn, because that's part of their survival, is they learn how to get angry. The first thing they learn is fear. And they express that fear through anger, through their crying and their rage. And that's a good program, really, for their survival because they can't do anything for themselves. And so the expressing that anger through their cry, they express that fear. It's a form of external control. The idea, which is a good idea when they're infants, is that as they cry loud, the, the care providers, their parents, are uncomfortable and they come to the rescue of this innocent, helpless child. And so that external control is the way that they get their needs met. So you think about that's the first thing we learn in, in this body is how to survive by expressing our anger, our fear. And that's a good thing to survive. Now, if you've been around a two and three and four year old along that phase there, they come in the kitchen and they see a cookie in the cookie jar and they want a cookie. And if they can't get that cookie, they have a big temper tantrum. For them, it feels like they're gonna die because that's how they are used to expressing their fear and they're expressing their anger when they don't get what they want. Now to them, that cookie represents survival. That's the emotion that is experienced. And so as good parents do, they see this child having this temper tantrum and they say, oh, it's time for lunch. Let's feed this child a sandwich or a nice meal. And then we can talk about the cookie after that. So as we grow, we learn that we won't die if we don't get the cookie, but it's, it's good to have a good meal and then we can enjoy that dessert. So external control works. Now, when they turn teenagers, we learn, if we didn't learn it enough when they were two, that we cannot control another human being, even our own children. We can, as parenting goes, control their privileges, but we cannot control them. <laughs> One of the stories that Dennis Waitley tells when he was this pilot coming home, he was going to be the man and teach his two-year-old child how to eat peas. So he had him in the high chair there and he was stuffing those peas in his two-year-old's mouth. And pretty soon he learned that he couldn't force those peas down that two-year-old's into the body because they just puffed up the cheeks and pretty soon it was all over him and all over the kitchen. And so he learned that you cannot control a two-year-old. So when they turn teenagers, 13, 14, 15, we cannot control them. But what we do often, I'm not recommending this, but I believe that's something that we all have done, something that I for sure have done a lot with my kids is disguise my anger, trying to produce fear into them through guilt. So with guilt, I'm not yelling at them, but I'm guilting them to get them to do what I want them to do. And so I talk about you should, different ways of saying you need to do that or else I'm going to do whatever. Okay. So you should, you ought, you must, you think about that, how we try to guilt our children into doing things and guilt other people. A lot of people do this as adults to each other is trying to guilt others into getting the, what they want. Also, uh, there's a whole nother lesson on guilt, on how we, we should and should not experience guilt.
<clears throat> but as guilt is, when we try to use guilt as a form of control to get someone to say, well, if, if you don't do what I think you ought to do, then you're going to be judged, you're going to be rejected. You're, I'm going to think you're less than if you're not doing what I think you should do. Well, that doesn't go over too well. But when you think about that, those are disguised forms of saying you will. And talking to Jack and Jill, I mean, the idea is, hey, Jack, you get over here and do this, or Jill, do this. Those kinds of direct commands, it's saying you will, and it's human nature. If you pause and think and feel that, when someone says you will, what is your automatic reaction inside? So one word for that that I use is resistance, okay? We have this innate nature that we do not like to be controlled. So when someone tries to control us, command us, there is resistance, automatic resistance. That just it's part of that survival part. Don't control me. Okay, so with that resistance, that always, over time, leads to chaos. So that is how we create chaos, whether in the short run or long run. I mean, anger is a form of trying to get control in the moment, maybe for safety, that's helpful, but that's the only time where controlling a situation as much as possible may be helpful. But in, most, in the long run, it always leads to chaos there. Okay, so this is the survival side, the bad wolf. Now think about the good wolf, how we love babies, even though they can't do much, but well, they can grow into Googling and, and all that, and we enjoy that. But with love, we recognize, rather than over here, the external control, we recognize that human beings have internal control. As they learn con uh, ex internal control, we call it integrity. If we grow in that, we work on that integrity. So when you work in your marriage and as a parent, dealing with your spouse, honoring that they are full of love and lovable, then we don't try to control them. What we do is we invite. And as we invite, things like would you, could you, and basically we can summarize that with the question, will you? Okay, look at how that's the opposite there. You will or will you? Now, of course, invitation doesn't guarantee you will get what you want. But when you invite, that nurtures that feeling of harmony and peace. You just think about, hey, Jack, will you do this? Jill, will you please help me out with this? That invitation, that breeds cooperation. And cooperation over time always creates order. That's order and harmony. So if that's what you're wanting, it's not necessarily guaranteed, but over time, that was, that's what we are creating when we invite and when we're kind uh, in doing that. So you think about that integrity and the internal control there. Now, <clears throat> I'm running out of space here, but it, since you're following along this part, we can squeeze in a little bit more right here. And we'll say that this is self-esteem. I remember when I was a fresh, well, it was a sophomore in college, the big push was self-esteem. You need to do this for your children. You need to do that for your children. You need to do everything so that they have high self-esteem. And the idea was good to a point, but it got way off the mark. Because when you look at self-esteem from this survival perspective, Self-esteem is based upon whether or not you're better or worse than someone. When we have high self-esteem, that's because we can do something more than someone else. So we can do something or we have something. That's what self-esteem is based upon. 
And so we think, oh, that, and, you know, we go through grade school growing up. I remember having a new Hot Wheel car and as playing out in the dirt and the sand at lunchtime. I felt like I had really high self-esteem there. And Fred, his car was older. So I had high self-esteem because I made judgment, which is a requirement to have high and low self-esteem. So this judgment really is something we want to learn to eliminate out of our life. But judgment is necessary for self-esteem. So if we're up here, we judge someone less than, then we have high self-esteem. If we judge someone higher than we are, then we have low self-esteem. It can happen very rapidly. We could be walking down the hallway and pass one person and with, it just happens subconsciously so much, judging that we're less than, and then that three steps later, we could be better than. So our self-esteem is very, very sensitive and vulnerable to external judgments. So there we go on the external again. Okay, now, given that, we can go here and on a horizontal line, this is different. If you look over in the bottom right with the good wolf, this is what I call self-worth. Self-worth is not based upon what we do and what we have. It is based upon who we are, okay? And we think about those precious little newborn babies, how precious they are, and they are of infinite worth. We all are infinite, infinite worth. Ran out of paper here. Infinite worth. Okay, so that's who we all are. We all are equal. And this is a belief that God created all of us and that we are of all equal value, no matter what race, religion, or sex, or what we can do or what we can have. We are all of equal equality in the sight of God. And so whether or not you believe that or not, I hope that you can also appreciate that as a human being, that we are worth the greatest thing on this earth. So I enjoy oftentimes reading about death experiences, near-death experiences. A friend of mine shared with me a time where she, she had open heart surgery. And during that time, she actually died on the operating table and was gone for a while. I can't remember how long she said, a couple minutes. But it was like 20 years after this event, where in a time she shared with me what had happened to her. And just remembering the feeling she had while she was understood as being dead on the table, she had a chance to meet God. And she just burst into tears, just remembering, feeling so homesick for that feeling and looking forward to the day that she can go there permanently. Anyway, so she shared with me the feeling she had. If you take that precious brand new newborn baby and you look at that baby and you look at those teeny tiny eyelashes and eyebrows and, and those teeny, teeny nose and lips. She said, just think about how intently you're looking at that infant, that brand new baby. She said, that is the best way I can even come close to describe how intensely close I felt God was looking at me and loving me as a his precious as his precious child you think about how precious you are think about how precious your spouse is and how as you work and honor that good wolf feed that good wolf in yourself and in your spouse do everything you can to be kind 
and to love them. And as you do invite them, you will have greater cooperation and greater order in your life and in your home. And with that, that order, you can be more successful in your career. You have greater health and harmony and peace. And so that is the main thing I wanted to share about understanding self-esteem and self-worth, how valuable that you really are about how wonderful it was when you met your spouse and how excited you are, how you were tonight. It's been fun. I have a son in the courting age and he's got a friend that he's probably seen every day in the last couple of weeks. So we hold our breath that things will continue to go well for him and his friend. All right. Okay, transitioning. I have something else. Let's see a question. What else did she learn when she died? Well, that's a longer story that we won't take time for here. She had a very good experience. I'll just summarize with that. She's a dear friend. We shared a counseling office for several years and worked as a crisis team members for about 10 years, covering all the crisis work in the county. All right. Okay, so I have... My next part I want to share. What I want to share was a, a one-page one summary that John Gray wrote. He wrote the, the thing that he got most famous for. He's written uh, several books now, but the first one is that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. That's a very good book in its time and lots of good principles there. Good summaries and understanding the, the differences between men and women. I also, along with that, like to say that men and women are from Earth because we all like the good wolf. We all enjoy kindness. We enjoy respect and appreciation. So in that sense, we're all the same. We all enjoy the good wolf. That being said, I'm sorry, ladies, I don't have a one-page summary for women, but uh, with Valentine's, it's good to express appreciation and love. And for some that might be service, you can do the dishes and clean the kitchen clean the bathrooms. For others, it's words of affirmation, expressing appreciation, telling them, reminding them how much you love and appreciate their beauty. Others it can be gifts and, and others will be hugs and kisses. So those are the love languages. And so you can do those and it's all good for Valentine's and good for any time. Incidentally, the studies show that a kiss needs to be more than six seconds to have its full effect. So a seven second longer kiss, it's about six seconds into before the dopamine starts getting activated in the brain. So when you give a good kiss, a peck is nice, yes. But if you want a good kiss, you need seven seconds or more. All right, so John Gray, he's talking about what men want. So yes, men want sex, but we don't argue with that. But we want to elevate, really, what a man really wants is relationship to feel successful in pleasing his partner. It is her fulfillment that signals to him that he is appreciated and loved. This seems easy, but with all the stress in our lives, it's hard to achieve. Many women return home at the end of the day feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, and maybe even frustrated from something that happened that day. Unfortunately, this is also the time when they reconnect with their partners. When a woman is tired, distracted, and agitated, it can cause a man to feel like he can't make her happy and sink into a state of frustration and apathy. When she does not seem happy to see him, something very significant significant begins to happen. His desire to please her, protect her, and provide for her gets dampened and it gets worse over time. So that's where we need to remind ourselves and have those weekly inventories to make sure we're keeping up. That's a side note there. Okay, so the more a woman acts and reacts from feelings of unhappiness, the more he feels his hard work counts for nothing and his life and relationship lose magic and meaning for him. So it is important for a woman to let her man know she is happy. 
make sure to point out to him that he is supporting you when you need it most. And on a side note, I'd also say when he's not supporting you when you need it most, it's important to lovingly invite him to reevaluate what he is or is not doing. I have a couple right now I'm working with where he went golfing while she was in the hospital. He could have gone to the hospital first, would have been a lot better thing. Now, 10 years later, he's having to work to figure out how to make up for his negligence. So there is the uh, phrase that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I like to say an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. So, <clears throat> okay, so regular appreciation helps a man to remember that he is successful even though she feels overwhelmed and exhausted. This will encourage him to continue to trying to make her happy and hopefully lighten her load too. This is a big issue in most relationships, but rarely discussed. Most men do not recognize the reason behind their feelings, so they find it very hard to explain those feelings to their partners. So I am telling the woman in hopes it will help them understand their men better. So just a few personal comments, professional ones, talking about how balance is important with that. And in the relationship, again, I've talked about this before and I'll continue over and over again. In our society today, I believe that we are continuing to evolve and part of that evolvement is equality in a marriage. Balance is important. When she acts pleased, when all is not right, he may believe he is doing well and will take advantage of that. So it's good to act pleased when it's real and it's sincere, but do not lie about being happy with your man if you're not happy with him. He needs to know you're not happy. Again, you want balance. And mentioned, mentioned before, it takes seven positive to equal one negative for a good staying status quo. So, and oftentimes less work and more results when you understand better the five love languages and you focus on what your spouse wants the most. So that is about what a man wants to know that he pleases his wife. So as I mentioned yesterday, I have more material and I have decided to commit to another level of doing these. So after I get my clients scheduled around, opening up my schedule for time to do this, I plan on starting to do this on Mondays, probably in March. It will be uh, Monday marriages will be the maybe the headline for the Monday time. So I'll spend about 30 to 45 minutes, probably at one o'clock. So stay tuned. Uh, that will be posted on my website, communicatinglove.com. And that's where I have my classes. I also I already have a couple dozen podcasts. You're welcome to listen to those. I've covered different things with stress management and relationship and also addiction and things like that. So there's opportunities to learn. So we'll call that good. I hope you have a great Valentine's and I'll be back here next year for National Marriage Week, the seven days before Valentine's. Well, all right, thanks everyone for your support. Happy Valentine's. <laughs>